Welcome to the new series of Speak Up, the television and social media platform for Freemasonry in New Zealand. I am Barry Rushton, your host, and thank you for joining us this evening. From the sunny Bay of Plenty, our first guest is Wayne Marriott. That's two R's and two T's. When it comes to our heritage, our genealogy, our history here in New Zealand, you will find Wayne right at the forefront. Our second guest tonight is Simon Black. And unfortunately, it will be me, an IT dummy, talking to an IT expert. However, this man is not stuck behind a computer all the time. He also runs to the top of the Sky Tower with a full fireman's kit to raise funds for charity. He's a great bloke. Now, closing out the show, of course, is our regular contributor, Graham Houston, who talks about a former governor of New Zealand, Sir Cyril Newell, another prominent Freemason. What a pleasure it is to have this week with us, Wayne Marriott from the sunny Bay of Plenty. Welcome, Wayne. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Nice to see you. And thanks for coming all that way. That, that's a beautiful area, your area. Oh, it's a fantastic love place. It. Now, listen, before we start, if that's okay, I'd just like to read something to our audience because it gives us the picture. It sums everything up. I'll rattle through it pretty quickly so I don't leave you sitting there, okay? But this is what was read by the when the national government were in and the Minister for Arts and Culture, I think it was Maggie Barry, she said about you in 2015 when you were appointed to the board of New Zealand and the Maori Heritage Council. She said, you have extensive experience in the heritage sector. You're a council member of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists, vice president of the Wakatani and District Historical Society and trustee for the War Wakatani Historical Society Scholarship Trust, have led museum projects in Southland, Nelson, Wellington and obviously Wakatani and also, you were a former head of operations in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar. That is remarkable. I mean, how did you get this history bug? Where did it all start from? Well, I, well, for me, I was very lucky. I mean, I grew up in Ashburton, so great country town as it was. It was a rural service centre in those days. Now it's become a, a lot larger than uh, the, the town I originally grew up in. Um, I was fortunate. I had grandparents, great-grandparents, um, lots of great-great-aunts and uncles who used to sit there and tell you stories. You didn't really know you were being told stories in those days. You were the nosy kid that was earwigging. Yeah, yeah. And so by earwigging, you suddenly met people who'd been in the Boer War, the last of the First World War survivors. Um, and then obviously, people that served in World War II were just a dime a dozen in those days. Mm -hmm. Now they're in the same situation yeah. as the people who I first met who served in the Boer War. When you were 16, something happened when you were 16? Well, at 16, um, I got elected to what's yeah. known as the Board of the Ashburton Historical Society. They were a scary group of people in those days. <laughs> Most of them had either taught my mother or my father, and in one case, I think one had even taught her one of my grandmothers. So, um, it, it, you know, I think I dropped the average age overnight from about 90-something <laughs> down to, to 37.5 you know, or, or 6. But that actually gave me the chance to, to get to understand and see how a, a small museum actually worked and I didn't know at that stage that would end up being my career. So I guess that interest in, in humanity and, and social history was really my driver. So you could go off to university, you could study English history, whatever. I cho chose to focus on New Zealand history and that's, that's something fantastic. that I've always enjoyed. Mum and Dad backed me into a business which was really the start of the opportunity to do some, some networking and then from there it was into a dealer gallery where I got to, to work, even though I was based in Dunedin, I worked throughout the country for a number of the corporates in the early 90s uh, developing corporate art collections. Right. And um, that was a huge start and, and a way to meet a number of, of amazing New Zealand artists. I mean, <clears throat> there were people, for example, you'd be dealing with Toss Wollaston or um, Doris Last Names now that the young artist artists and art historians coming through just can't believe that somebody actually had the chance to do even sell on their behalf. Ralph Hotley, Marilyn Webb, all of those guys just were fantastic. part of a, a wonderful cache of about a hundred and plus artists this particular gallery had. Then I was asked if I wanted to actually take on a museum and so uh, John Coley who was the director of the Robert McDougall Art Gallery in Christchurch at that stage had done a review on Southland um, Southland had the Southland Museum and Art Gallery. It was quite an old institution. They'd never had a person in charge of art before. So I was the initial appointee, became one of the founding trustees of the Southland Art Foundation, and um, from there it just, the career blossomed. At the age of? 
Oh, I was probably about 23, 24. That's fantastic. So it was, it was wonderful. But then while you were doing that, weren't you suddenly plucked or called and you eventually ended up, well not eventually, but you were called to do Head of Operations at the Islamic Museum in Qatar in Doha. Yep. And, uh, how did a Kiwi lad get from Southland or Wellington or wherever you were at the time to, to uh, Qatar? Well, it, it starts off with a number of processes. While I was uh, uh, living in Southland, I was uh, received a Winston Churchill Fellowship. Right. So I went overseas and I actually studied the first known um, European family, as they were termed, living in New Zealand. Uh, and, and it was a case of trying to identify who they were. Mm -hmm. So we had a date of around 1795. We found the mum, dad, and, the, and, the, and a number of kids. So I was pulling that information uh, together. Part of that research led me to London, where I looked at the the people who were actually shipwrecked in Dusky Sound at that stage and started working in uh, Grand Lodge um, in Holborn, going through the big volumes at that stage, looking for those who were in the various um, lodges in India, um, in Lodge Bengal in particular, trying to work out if in fact there was the potential of one of the earliest lodge meetings, not actually being in the Bay of Islands, but potentially in Dusky Sound in 1795. Now that will make a few people <laughs> sit there and blink their eyes they and would. think what the heck's going on. So I, I started on that research, came back to New Zealand, um, eventually ended up in a role in Wellington where I started the, the MBA, completed that, got to Nelson and worked on the development of the Nelson Provincial Museum. So we took what was a, an old institution out in uh, Stoke, brought it back into the centre of town using the excuse, and it, and it was an excuse at the time, that we were on the corner of Hardy and Trafalgar Street in Nelson, so it was perfect Battle of Trafalgar, and we were heading towards 2005, which was the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. So all the stars aligned, we were able to do that. Um, one of the, the things that occurred during that was a visit from the American Embassy, and suddenly I had this invitation to become part of the um, International Visitor Program, which the US State Department uh, puts on, so I headed to the States did the research, um, was part of the team, got back to New Zealand and probably it was about 12 months later I got a phone call one day asking me if I'd be interested in this role that was in Sharjah which is actually in the UAE. I went to the interview and while I'm sitting in this interview, left it, my phone rang and it was somebody ringing from Doha and I thought, how yeah, do they know I'm here yeah. and where, where is Doha? Yeah, that was yeah, the first thing, right. you know, you'd, you, you, you're not quite sure. So the result was that I actually flew to London the next morning, um, had an interview the following day and was appointed Head of Operations to the Museum of Islamic Art. Now, in, in a 24-hour research space, you suddenly realised that here was going to be one of the most um, amazing iconic buildings of the 21st century being built, built. in, in yeah. Doha. It had its own island, the architect was I.M. Pei, um, he's just passed away, I think he was 101 or 102 oh. when he just uh, died amazing man, designed the glass pyramid over the Louvre um, and to be able to be given the, that opportunity to work with a team of people like him was just incredible. So I came back to New Zealand, I'd actually been offered a, a role with Historic Places Trust as it was at that stage so suddenly the world turned around, I resigned from yeah. the job I was about to start on the Monday then four weeks later headed into the Middle East and started working on that project. Mm -hmm came back to New Zealand after my role was completed and then started work on another two other museum projects here. Is that when you uh, started or started with that what they called the first living building? Uh, Tuhoi have this interesting habit where you're invited for a cup of tea. So um, I was a bit naive, I didn't understand that a cup of tea meant uh, there's something we would like you to, 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 have, a, to have a look at <laughs> and, and see. So the result was that um, we had the, the opportunity um, to, to have a concept with Ivan Mercep, um, who had been engaged by Tuhoi to actually work on the first living building yeah. uh, challenge. It was an amazing project. My part was quite a small small part of it, looking primarily at the library and the archive side to, to ensure that Tuhoi had post-settlement uh, the right facilities going forward to be able to preserve totally their material. Totally self-sufficient, isn't it? What's, what's wonderful about it is not only the fact that here was this great New Zealand architect, Ivan Mercep, and the, the saddest part was that Ivan didn't live to see, see the, the building actually yeah, yeah. Um, opened, but it was the vision from Tuhoi 
which I think threw everybody completely, and, and especially from their chair, Tamati Kruger, um, and their chief executive, uh, Kirsty Luke, who were prepared to get in along with the other board members and champion something that was so left field, it was not funny. That is something I think that we need to do with a lot more of our architecture in New Zealand, because when people go there, they are completely blown away by the vision um, and the the brightness of what that particular building does. It's it's fantastic. It's sensational. It's really good. Now, amongst all that, of course, is that you're actually writing a book, right? And you you've got yourself a, a, <clears throat> close to finishing. No, I wish. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to say I'm close to finishing. It's, no. It's, so so the name of your book, I believe, or the title of your book is the history of electrification in Eastern Bay of Plenty. That's correct. Seems a lofty title, but it sounds it's, great. It's, look, it's a very lofty title. What it basically means is that I'm looking at the history of the current Horizon Energy and the, the Horizon Energy Group. That dates back all the way through um, to the development of two particular places, the Bay of Plenty Electric Power Board and also the Whakatane MED. So you had two uh, organisations, both starting really post-World War One all the way, coming all the way through and eventually they amalgamated. So it's looking at the fights, the um, mm. the debates, the, the competition. Um, it's actually been, it's been very interesting to look at because something that I've been able to take it through into another area was uh, specifically getting down to the Freemasons involved. Mm. Now if, if you go to the original board and you have a look at uh, the original staff members, well all were members of oh. the Lodge of Portiki. English Constitution. Wow. If you then come across and look at the Whakatane one, they were members of Whakatane Lodge 198, <laughs> including the master who happened to be mayor. Um, let's just say there was a lot of competition going on between the English Constitution and the New Zealand <laughs> Constitution, <laughs> which probably wasn't seen as um, de rigueur at that time, but it was, it was certainly about protecting your own patch. And Eventually, after a number of years, both of those organisations have amalgamated. At the moment, where I'm, uh, the stage I am in writing is up to 1940, so um, with the emergency war regulations and all of that coming through. For me, as somebody who's never really been the, the great science graduate or anything like that, it's absolutely fascinating I'm to, sure to look at it, but also taking it very much from the social history looking at the individuals behind it and learning a lot more about the, the people who are working. Now in Whakatane, the, the lodge, how many lodges in Whakatane? Just the one or the two? Just one now. Just two. Yes. And so, community activities. I believe you've done something recently that, uh, as part of your community, you, you'd like to show us and tell us about that? So back in 2015, there were the Edgecombe floods yep. and the, the quite significant floods around the Eastern Bay of Plenty. We have the Acacia uh, Charitable Trust, which is um, and a, a group of appointees by the District Grand Master of the uh, Bay of Plenty area. So we looked and thought, what could we do? And we realised that for many people, their homes had been flooded, they lost many of their possessions. We got a call, and it was simply a case of help. There was a lady who had one photograph album, and that one photograph album had the only photographs of her son that had passed away in it. And it was, what can I do? She went to a local business, they said $25 per photograph and we will copy these for you. Yeah. Now, you're in the middle of a natural disaster, yeah. it's no it's fault of your own. So what we did was we actually put our heads together and said, how can we help? So having worked within the cultural heritage sector, we had access to very good uh, photographers. Yeah. So we tracked down a brilliant photographer here in Auckland and we gave him the job and we said, right, we need you to come and work with our community. He had a background in forensic photography and the police, so he knew how to handle yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of this stuff. And so we pulled together the, the various lodges, and there were um, the three in the area at that stage, and said, we need your help. So they marshalled the people. There was the, the slow capture digitisation process, and after about 12 months, because it did take 12 months to, to do, we had captured over 150,000 photographs and negatives which had been flooded during that that process. So everybody received one of these. That's fantastic. Um, all of their photographs were on the memory stick, which was um, uh, labelled as uh, from Freemasons New Zealand. But where we were coming from was simply, this is something that we could do. It gave people back hope. It gave them their pride. Certainly it helped in terms of mental health because for, for one man in particular, he brought in 13,000 photographs. 
Whoa. And we just, we were a bit stunned yeah. when they started coming in. He had only moved very recently into the Edgecombe area, so he was the family genealogist, and so he had all the original family photos back to the 1860s. Whoa. They were all in the plastic tubs, they were sitting in the basement, and as the water came up, it went into the plastic tubs and simply filled. Whoa. And you managed so, to save all of those So we probably uh, copied about... 85 to 90 percent of, of yes. what he had That's so he actually had a fabulous. record of everything fabulous. so they were all backed up and I, I thought that was one way that um, any community um, group could sit there and make a, a real bitch. contribution back to that community so Wayne thank you for coming tonight and thank folks, you very much if you're down the Bay of Plenty stop by Wayne's place it's called Art Naked is that right it's a it's an art gallery it is indeed. And I've seen it on the, on the, on the web and it looks fantastic. So if you're down that area, much. Wakatani, pop in and say hello to Wayne. Thanks Thank again you. for coming all the way. You're welcome. Cheers. All right, it's great. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the show, Simon Black. Simon, great to see you all the way from Wellington. Fantastic. Thanks, right? Barry. You're involved with... I hate to say it, but IT, right? I am. Look, I, I have to admit right up front that I am so computer illiterate. When someone says they're in IT, if someone says they're a software developer or a software writer, there's a big glaze that goes right over my eyes, you know? But I know that your company is going from strength to strength. Mm. Tell us about your company and what's happening. Oh, well, look, we had a dream. Uh, I had a dream years and years ago. Uh, I used to work in the corporates, and I uh, thought, well, actually, there's one piece of software left in me, and I'd like to do it for myself. Right. And so 10 years ago, I started a web company called Webs and then moved into the commercial side of things called New Wave. And what we did is that we mm -hmm. thought, let's try and solve one of the big problems in the country at the moment. And that was building consent submissions. Building? Consent submissions. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. you know, yep. electronically submitting building yeah, consents yeah. to your council. And wow. so we partnered with a company uh, called Master Business Systems and Fielding. And together, we actually had uh, the whole end-to-end -end solution. So uh, what we did is we formed a joint venture. Wow went for some government tenders and won those. And now what we're doing is we've delivered um, this building consent portal to 10 councils and hopefully within the next 12 months, we'll get another 10 on board. And also we're starting to get into the central government side of things as well. So you know, we're yeah. just starting to, to, to get that traction there, which is that good. That sounds fantastic because yeah. I know you hear it day after day that people want to do something, they want to put, build an extra room on their house and to get the consent and the time that it takes seems like forever. It does. So it does. You, if you're doing something to speed this up, that's got to be great. It does. Well, the feedback we're getting at the moment is excellent. Great. Yeah. So how many councils around the country are there? Are there, are there hundreds? About 72. 72? Yeah. Wow. Surely... I won't say I like the dominoes, but if one council starts seeing how effective this is working, I'm sure you're hoping that, that, that most of them will. Correct, that's right. We're starting to get that uh, recognition and momentum. I think, you know, council's a little bit hesitant of taking on new technology. But once they see it working and working well, then all of a sudden they're starting to get uh, on board now. So we're looking at uh, getting an uptake this year, and the whole team itself is doing a good job. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that, um, like a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, there are lots of influences in, in families, and I believe your father was, had a great influence on you, Huge. right? I mean, um, he said a couple of things to you uh, when you were quite young, right, that, uh, that have stayed with you for the whole, all of your life. In actual fact, you use part of them constantly. Is that correct? I do. What were the couple of things that your dad did say to you? Well, the two things that he presented to me, you know, and I knew he's a Freemason, but I didn't know really what he did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from a young age, uh, he had these apron, and he went to meetings and stuff like that, and I didn't really know what that was all about. But the things he did say to me is, he read this, and it was the four-way uh, test in Rotary. Right. And also there was a poem called If by Rudyard Kipling, yep. also another, yeah, yeah, you know, another Freemason. Could be, uh, yeah, well-known yeah. Freemason. Now, of course, you say you, 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 you fell over your father's suitcase, right? So I believe yeah. that you and your brother just started walking around playing with these Oh, with these that's right, things. yeah, yeah. So when Dad wasn't looking, you know, it's like yeah, Freemason in those days were like hush-hush. So, um, you know, Dad would go to these meetings. So Dad was actually quite open about his Freemasonry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then there's this apron and these, uh, you know, this, this, this collar there and they had these gloves, white gloves there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we'd put that on and, you know, they had this Just blue book. I don't know what, you know, what's all in there. There's all, half of it was it. missing. So, uh, you know, but we, we didn't know what it was, but it was actually quite intriguing, you know, all these really meetings here. Yeah. Now, I know that there's another part of your life, which uh, apart from Freemasonry, that you really do enjoy as well. And that's, mm. the, that's the community service that you give uh, under the Fire and Emergency New Zealand. Oh, yes, right? absolutely. Tell fantastic. us a little bit why you enjoy that. There's lots of different mm. community activities that you could join. Why is this one put a nice little sort of string to your heart? Mm. 
I think these two organisations, uh, you know, Freemasonry and the New Zealand Fire Service, or as it uh, is now, Fire and Emergency New Zealand, huge similarities for me. Yeah. You know, um, they've got charity and community at the heart. Um, uh, they've got trust between the team and members. Mm. You've got the fraternity or the, um, the camaraderie yeah. um, and fellowship between the, the people there, the right. closeness in it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't realise that um, about 85% of fire emergency New Zealand are volunteers. Fantastic, isn't it? So, so there's some huge similarities there. Now you do some personal things yourself, right? I mean, yes. you, I believe you're in the Sky Challenge. Uh, I and, do. And going I do. to do it next year. I'm going to do it this year, next year as next well. Year, yes. Tell us about. Tell us what motivates you to do that. What's the purpose? I mean, what's the cause that you support? Uh, Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand. They run this uh, event called Sky Tower Steer Challenge, and so that's directed at the, uh, the firemen of the country. And so I think this year it was about a thousand firemen got to walk up the tower and get sponsored to do that, you know, so it's up to them to go out and find sponsorship. You just don't run up in your jockey shorts, right? You've <laughs> got to lay yourself down with stuff, correct? What, <laughs> tell us how it starts and what do you do? Yes, well, the challenge is, is that you've actually got to walk up the Sky Tower um, in all your fire kit. Boom. Yeah, so, so it's our, our structural firefighting kit. It weighs about 10 kilograms in itself. Then you put a BA on as well. So last year, or uh, well this year actually, a I did BA, a breathing apparatus. Breathing apparatus. Okay. So yeah. I used got to break these down. That's for right. Yeah, BA. Yeah. yeah. So so I did the firefighter steel challenge, which I wore a, a steel cylinder, which is about um, 18 kgs. Wow. And then you got your firefighting kit. Yeah. And it doesn't let uh, you know heat come in, but also doesn't let heat go out. Yeah, <laughs> and so um, I did that uh, 60 floors in 18 minutes. Fantastic. So it was a great, great uh, psychological and fitness uh, challenge as well. So. So the obvious question is, of course, once you got to the top, uh, I hope there was a beer there or something, was there for you? <laughs> Nothing like a big that? glass of water. Big glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been absolutely, well, I take that back. You must have known that you did the job. Did the job, yeah. I was, I was very happy, actually. Tell us how your lungs were feeling. And tell oh, how you felt. not too bad. I think I did the right training beforehand. Right. And uh, you get to the top, you feel exhausted, but you feel also euphoric as well about it. So, I bet uh, you do. Yeah. I bet you do. But Simon, it's been great having you on. Much Thank success you, with your company. I know it's going great, and I uh, really look forward to seeing you up the, up the sky today. Thanks, Thank you. Very Graham, good to see you again. I know you've got someone really special to tell us about today. So mm -hmm. looking forward to it, my friend. Thank you, Barry. Yes, today we're going to talk about a former Governor General of New Zealand. His name was Sir Cyril Newell. He was Governor General from 1941 to 1946. But he was a guy with an interesting, interesting background. He was born into a military family, both mother and father. He was educated at the Royal College, uh, Military College at Sandhurst. And uh, he was in both two branches of the, of the armed forces, the Army and the Air Force. He learned to fly about 1911 and that saw his passion for flying so that he ended up joining the Air Force and after in the Bomber Command and after a series of relatively quick promotions he found himself after a number of years as the Air Chief Marshal of the Royal Air Force. He was considered by some historians as to not be the most gifted of the candidates that they had to consider however he got the job. And one of the conflicts that was happening at that stage, about 1936-1937, was the cabinet, the British cabinet, couldn't decide exactly where the, the money or the development should be going. Was it into the Bomber Command or was it into the Fighter Strike Force? He being a bomber uh, from the Bomber Command was flexible enough to say, well, there has to be both. And he saw the, the Fighter Force and particularly the new development of the Hurricane and the Spitfire that he spent money extensively on the development of the Hurricane and Spitfire and on building the aircraft, which was probably just as well given the Battle of Britain was just yeah, around the corner. Proved right, wasn't it, in the end? The Battle of Britain was basically the end of Cyril Newell. He was relieved of that position in about 1940-41, and uh, officially it was said that overwork, tired, and time that he retired. Several historians said, no, that's not true. You were fired. <laughs> you were fired. And uh, there was a disagreement amongst some of the hierarchy, political intrigue, and out of that, he lost the confidence of Winston Churchill. 
now, like a lot of people in those positions, what happens when you fire where, someone where like that? Go? He was appointed as Governor General of New Zealand by we'll Winston Churchill. as far Churchill. away as we can, right? <laughs> he caused no problems. So between 1941 and 1946, he became the Governor General of New Zealand. Now, he travelled extensively throughout New Zealand during that, during that time. And in fact, one biographer said that it was a, for Newell, it was one nice long break. Oh, wasn't that? And he spent the rest of the war in New Zealand. As I said, he travelled extensively and he spoke wherever he went, but mainly about the war. Was he popular? Well, the consensus seems to be that he was generally popular, although he did have one or two issues that, uh, along the line. Now, here is a couple of things. He did not have a great relationship with Peter Fraser, who was the Prime Minister at the time in New Zealand. He, they worked well together. But I think there was not the full level of trust that they may have had. His first little run-in with Peter Fraser was in 1942. And in 1942, he reprimanded the Prime Minister. That was when Newell was presented with a, peti a petition from Peter Fraser to remit the sentences of four prisoners who were sentenced to be flogged. I thought that went out with the, with the Dark Ages flogging. Well... That crossed my mind when I read it. Yeah. In fact, I read it on from two or three different sources okay. flogging because, like you, I thought that went out. They gave the petition to, to the Governor-General for him to sign and commute the sentences. But Newell refused. <laughs> he said no. Basically, he said, you always come and ask for these sentences to be remitted. I refuse. If the law is so bad, change the law. Mm. There was a stalemate, an impasse happened, and Peter Fraser and Walter Nash said they weren't going to do anything. And so he knew it wasn't going to do anything. So there was an impasse for a few days. Eventually, a compromise was received. Uh, that was that Newell would commute the sentences or re remit the sentences for the flogging of those four guys, but the government undertook to repeal the act. Mm -hmm that allowed for flogging. And whilst they did that the following year, they also included capital punishment. So capital punishment and flogging went right. out of the Act. Did he, did you know, did he become a, a Grand Master of New Zealand? He became Grand Master of New Zealand and uh, whilst he was here and uh, was involved with Freemasonry whilst he was in New Zealand. Because he was a Freemason when he did come to New Zealand, part of the English Constitution. He had been initiated into Lodge Antiquity in uh, the number two in the English Constitution about in October 1940. So he was another Freemason yeah, involved yeah. in shaping New Zealand. And certainly, I think that confrontation helped change the way that we view a number of things today when it comes to uh, the way that we treat people for crimes and things of, of similar similar nature. He's not one of the governor generals that really stand out in the mind of everybody, but he was one that in, a, in his own way had quite an influence during his time here in New Zealand. Yeah. And another person, another Freemason, which has been involved in the development of New Zealand society as we know it today. today. Another great choice, Graham. You always have to find these great, interesting people, mate. Keep it up. Thank I you, Barry. It. Thank you, Graham. Well, that's our show for this week. Don't forget, if you'd like to know more about Freemasonry, and you won't find it in the Dan Brown's book, but you will by going to the Grand Lodge website, which is freemasonsnz.org. In the meantime, if you've been thinking, planning, or asking questions about joining Freemasonry, we have a website for this very purpose. It's simply welcome to freemasonry.co.nz. We hold a regular dinner experience where you can meet other Freemasons before making a decision to join. So once again, thanks for joining us. See you next week.